Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We are going to be continuing with colligative properties. I know it's a weird word, colligative properties. All right, all right, let's get right into it. Colligative properties, what are they? Um, the presence of solute particles makes the physical properties of a solution, you know, the boiling point, the freezing point, all that kind of stuff, different than those of a pure solvent. Huh? Okay, let's, let's break it down. These properties are known as colligative properties. All right, great, that's the title. It is the number of particles that influences the variation the most, not the chemical identity, aka what the chemical is. Okay, that still doesn't fully explain it. What am I trying to say? Look, if I've got a beaker of water here, my beaker mug, some of you have seen it, some of you for the first time. This is a beaker of water. It's got some water in it. If I were to take this water and try to put it in the freezer, it would freeze at zero degrees, and it would, of course, boil at 100 degrees Celsius. If I put salt in it, it's now salt water. It's a solution of salt and water, right? Water would be the solvent. Salt would be the solute. Salt water doesn't freeze at zero. It freezes a little colder. It doesn't boil at 100. Why does it do something different? Because of the salt. Remember, freezing and boiling and all that kind of stuff is related to the intermolecular forces, the ability of the different molecules to combine and to connect and all those things. Well, if I put other stuff in there, that other stuff is going to have a different profile of intermolecular forces. Salt, for example, would be ionic, whereas the water is polar. That's going to have a different behavior. It's going to act differently. It's going to appear different. And those differences are going to be noticeable. So let's take a look in more detail. Boiling point elevation. OK, we're going to talk about the boiling point going up, right? Elevation, bigger, higher, up, more. Boiling point. The boiling point is going to go up. The lower. The lowering of a solution's vapor pressure elevates the boiling point above that of a pure solvent. Okay, it's been a while since we looked at vapor pressure, so let's remember vapor pressure is the pressure of the liquid pushing up against the air, right? So if I lower the vapor pressure, that means that the water, for example, is going to have a harder time pushing out of the beaker, right? Any water that's trying to evaporate or boil is going to have a harder time because the water is going to be pushing down harder. So it's attempting to escape. Why would the vapor pressure be reduced? Well, again, let's think about the physical properties of matter here. Polar polar bonds, like between water and water, are strong, but they're not as strong as ionic ionic bonds. So if I've got like a water here and an ion here, these two are going to be pulled together even tighter. So by putting salt in here, I end up pulling everything in even tighter because the strength of those attractive forces is greater. Now if it's greater, that means that there's harder for particles to escape, right? Because as they try to escape, they get pulled back in. So it's kind of like uh, if it was a hot day out, right, everyone spreads out. But if it's a cold day, everyone's going to get in close together for warmth. Maybe not so much today. It's unseasonably warm around here for some reason. So what we're seeing here is, is that when they all pull in tighter, it's harder for an individual particle to escape, right? Because they're trapped inside of a little cage. That means that in order for them to escape, I have to give it more energy than normal. So the boiling point elevates. It goes up. Remember that the boiling point of a liquid is the temperature at which the vapor pressure equals the atmospheric pressure. The pressure where the water pushing up or the water vapor pushing up is equal to the air pushing down. A solution does not boil when it reaches the solvent's boiling point because its vapor pressure is still lower than the atmospheric pressure. So as I just described with water, the water is going to be held in tight so it can't escape, or the particles that normally could escape cannot. Continuing here, the higher the temperature is needed to raise to the vapor pressure to equal the atmospheric pressure. So you got to raise it up higher. I almost said the sentence right. The boiling point of, for example, sodium chloride is 100.51 degrees Celsius. Why 512? It's not a big difference, but it's more because, as I said, the polar ionic bonds are a little bit stronger. Now, if I were to make it even more uh, concentrated, right, if I put more and more salt, then it would be higher and higher still because you get even more 
ionic character in the bonds, which makes it tougher, harder for it to pull apart. Note that in general, only the solvent particles vaporize. The solute particles are generally left behind, right? Like water can evaporate because the water particles can turn into a vapor. Salt doesn't turn into a vapor at any reasonable temperature. We're looking at like for salt, it's 800 degrees for it to melt. And it's like 2000 degrees for it to vaporize, I think. I'm not sure. Google will check that. Check that with Google. Next one, freezing point depression. To be fair, most people are depressed when it is cold outside. Ha ha, weather joke. All right, we had elevation of the boiling point, right? The boiling point is higher because the particles are held together better. Freezing point depression is kind of the opposite. Molecules on the surface of the ice melt into water, and molecules of water freeze onto the surface of the ice. Remember, all particles are moving. So when I've got my particles set up in a nice lattice and they're all frozen in place, one of the guys near the end might be like, I'm going to make a break for it. Huh! And they run. But then another guy might come back in and get grabbed by the rest of them and pulled into the lattice. So it's a constantly shifting arrangement whether or not something is frozen or a liquid, right? It doesn't just stay there permanently forever. We talked about this with the phase change diagrams. You may remember the phase change diagrams tended to look something kind of like this, right? We'd have it and then it would come up and plateau and up and plateau and up and plateau. There's the temperature. No, wait, this was the temperature. This was the time. There we go. So again, right, this is a whole plateau area because it takes time for something to melt or for something to freeze in the case of down here. Well, the reason it takes time is because at all times, some of it's melting, some of it's freezing. It's going back and forth constantly. It's always moving, always changing. It's never static. And that changes things. All right. So... What does that do for us? Well, glad you asked. When the freezing rate, so that's the speed of something turning into a solid, is equal to the melting rate, so that's the speed of the solid turning into a liquid, the amount of ice and water is constant, right? So what does that mean? Okay, so I've got my lattice, right? And I've got 10 particles in the lattice and 10 particles that are liquid, right? The lattice is crystal, right? So it's ice. So I got 10 ice. One of them leaves. I got nine ice. Another one leaves. I got eight ice. Okay, so right now I'm, I'm losing ice, right? It's just turning into water. But what happens if at exactly the same time that two guys left, two guys came in? Well, then it's balanced, right? Two guys leave, two guys come in. I still got 10 on both sides. It's very simple, right? Heck, do I have enough markers? I might have enough markers. There we go. There's my five for ice. And here's my five for water. Literally, as I described, two of them melt away. They turn into water. But at the same time, two guys move over. I still got five and five. So I still have the same amount of ice and I still have the same amount of water. So the two values are constant. This broadly speaking, is what's happening when we hit that zero point, right? When we hit the, the phase change where it should be able to go from one to the other. In order for something to become more ice, remember this is the ice side over here. In order for, here, we'll put the glass over here so we know this is water. Over here is water. So in order for we get more ice, I have to have a situation where, you know, like one of these guys moves over, but two of these guys come over, right? And now, oh, look, now I'm getting more on this side, right? Maybe one comes over and two of these guys come over again. So at this rate, right, the rate of freezing is bigger than the rate of melting. One guy comes over, two guys go over. So as you can see, over time, I'm losing my liquid water. It's turning into solid water, ice. One, two. One, two. Hey, there we go. We got all ice, right? This could just as easily go the other direction, right? If something's melting, that means that, like, Two go away, maybe one comes back. Two go away, maybe one comes back. And over time, I get more and more water. So that's the method by which this works. It's all about a rate, because nothing ever stands still. Not even me. This amount of water and ice will remain the same unless the conditions are changed in a way that favors one side or the other. Right? I make it colder. I make it hotter. Super obvious. Taking a little further. 
Adding a solute in the form of salt to the ice and the water makes it a solution. What is that going to do for us? The salt replaces some of the water molecules surrounding the solid ice, therefore blocking them from contacting the solid. What am I saying? All right, so let's set this back up again. Here's our water. Here's our ice. Here's our salt. My props are the best. Random set of keys. Mm, hard to see that. Here we go. Basket's in the way. They can't get in. There's stuff in the way. The salt. The salt stops it. This still melts. It still escapes. But these guys can't touch the lattice. They can't freeze, which means even though they should be able to, right? They have enough energy or a lack of energy. They should be able to freeze, but they can't get over there because this is in the way. Then, again, the same thing happens. One of these melts. Two of these guys try to roll over. Salt's in the way. Can't get through. So you can see overall, despite the fact that I'm telling you, because I'm moving one this way and two this way, despite the fact that I'm telling you this should freeze, right? It should freeze because I'm saying two go this way for every one that goes this way, right? Two to one ratio, that's not good. The ice is being blocked by the salt, so the rate of freezing is being depressed. So it doesn't happen as much. Thus, in order for this thing to actually freeze, you have to lower the temperature even more than normal. You have to freeze this thing so much that when these guys try to come over and, and touch, even though they can't, they don't care. They just freeze around it. They make like a like a igloo around the thing, right? They they bury it under the ice as it forms because they're like, no, we're too cold. We can't. We have to. So that's what we're looking at here, right? The rate of things happening, and what we see is is that the salt just interferes. It gets in the way. It stops it from happening. Now, obviously, this was a very simple two-dimensional example with the best props, but it's the same basic idea when it comes to salt. Ages and ages ago, I had found a video that showed all of this happening in like real time with molecules. It was awesome. I've lost it since. The internet is a big place. Maybe one day. Maybe one day. In the meantime, you guys get markers and baskets. The salt does not pack easily into the array of molecules in the solid, so it kind of blocks them. As a result, fewer water molecules solidify, and the freezing rate decreases or is depressed, hence the phrase. In other words, the solution freezes at a lower temperature than the pure solvent. The freezing point, for example, of a sodium chloride solution is roughly negative 3.4. So... You may, you may have heard, or maybe you've come from places or are living in places where uh, they throw salt on the road during the winter. Yeah, they don't do that around here because all that it does is make it so that way the rate of melting is slightly faster. And that's great if the temperature doesn't get lower than negative 3.4 degrees Celsius in winter. Right? If you're zero, it'll be frozen. If you're negative 3.4 and you toss some salt on the road, the ice will melt because there's salt interfering with the freezing process. And around here, despite today's incredibly warm temperature, usually it's negative 40 at this time of year. Salt isn't going to do anything. This is why around here, they don't put down salt on the road. They put sand. The purpose of sand has nothing to do with making the snow melt. Nobody thinks the snow will melt until, I'm going to say, August. It's a little exaggeration, but I'm going to say that. And the reason for that is because the, the purpose of the sand is to help give more traction for tires. So as a result, our roads are covered in sand during the year, and then we end up, you know, clearing the road and throwing the snow on top of the boulevard or the sidewalks, and there's sand everywhere. But other places in the world, they use salt, which means that their boulevards and sidewalks get painted white with the leftover salt. Because again, remember, as we talked about later, when this stuff eventually melts in the summer months, it's not going to have the salt dissolve slash melt away because it's not hot enough. Nowhere gets hot enough to melt salt. Well, hopefully not. So all aqueous solutions display this freezing point depression, aka anything dissolved in water. So anything that interferes with the ability of stuff to freeze by just throwing it in the way. It doesn't have to be salt, but salt is one of them. Easy to do. Salt water is everywhere. But we could do anything. 
the more salt present, the greater the depression of the freezing point. Any foreign substance, sugar, alcohol, etc., will cause this freezing point depression. So, for example, this is why alcohol does not freeze at the same temperature as water, even though alcohol is almost like drinking alcohol, as we have discussed in the organic unit. Drinking alcohol is almost entirely water, because pure alcohol, as discussed, is poison. So, in order to drink it, we gotta like cut it a bit. So it's almost entirely water. So like a beer might be 5%, say. A 5% means that 5% of it's alcohol, the rest 95% of it's water. But it doesn't freeze because of freezing point depression. The alcohol gets in the way. Particle application, a practical application of freezing point depression. Particle, I can reach. Salt is used on roads and walkways to melt ice because it's inexpensive and readily available. Again, this is used in places that don't get as cold as here. If we use salt here, we'd just be seasoning the asphalt for no reason. Ethylene glycol is the main component of antifreeze and airplane de-icers. It's another compound. It's even stronger than salt. It's a little more toxic, just a little bit. You pour that on top of ice, it interferes with the rate of freezing. So slowly the ability of things to stay frozen fade as it gets more and more towards the liquid side. To survive in the Arctic, many fish and insects produce a large amount of glycerol, which lowers the freezing point of their blood. So their blood is ice cold. Technically, it's below ice cold. And yet it's still a liquid, all because of the glycerol, a naturally occurring organic version. So there you go. Freezing point depression allows us to mess around with things and keep things liquid when we want them to be. Boiling point elevation lets us stop things from boiling too soon. Both of these are useful properties of solutions. And that's about it. Colligative properties are pretty straightforward. The only hard part is that the two ideas are so similar to each other. Similar, you say? How can they be similar? Well, here's the thing, right? We just spent a bunch of time talking about uh, freezing point elevation, and it all makes perfect sense, except that we weren't talking about freezing point elevation. We talked about freezing point depression, because it's cold out, and we're depressed when it's cold. Freezing cold. We talked about boiling point elevation, not boiling point depression. Why am I doing this? Why am I mixing up the words? Because I'm trying to demonstrate that it's very easy to get them confused. So remember, a little mnemonic to help you remember. When it's cold out, you're depressed. Freezing point depression. Boiling point elevation. When you're angry, your boiling point goes up. The freezing point one's easier. Make sure you don't get them confused. It's very easy for people to do. It happens all the time. And that's where I'm going to leave it. When I see you guys next time, we'll be doing concentration probably the single most important part of the solutions unit. Till then.